Uh, welcome back, everybody. And this is the final session. And Professor Rajmani at 7 a.m. in UK now. He is very kind enough to be with us. He will talk on the venous leg ulcer, keeping it simple. And Professor Rajmani is adjunct professor of Chiang Mai University, Thailand, and also advisory professor, Shanghai Jiao Tong University School of Medicine, China. Rajwani is trained with an accredited angiologist and clinical scientist. His research focus in the microcirculation, tissue hypoxia, and improved wound healing. During his years in National Health Service, Ra Professor Raj was involved in clinical imaging and research into tissue viability. He developed ultrasound-driven technique to image the veins and established a clinical service. Several graduate and PhD students worked in his uh, guidance, and the last of his PhD students are in the process of finishing their research thesis in the University of Southampton. Presently, Professor Raj is an independent consultant, also the adjunct professor, and he has established track record of authoring over 350 scientific publications including referred papers, reviews, and also he has a seven edited books in the field of wound healing. And he also editor in chief International Journal of Lower Extremity Wounds, a SAGE publications product. And Professor Raj also serves on the editorial board of Chinese Barnes and Truma Journal. And recent research publication from their group includes the systematic reviews and meta analysis of nutritional supplementation in chronic lower extremity wounds, as well as a conscious paper for optimizing the use of technology in wound management. Professor Raj is an experienced clinical trialist. His motto, a treatment, be it a device or a drug, is only as good as the number of patients who can access it. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I have to open the... We welcome Professor Raj. And... Thank you very much for that uh, uh, introduction. Um, again, I bring good morning from England, but your, your day over in Kuala Lumpur is already uh, into 3 p.m. So you had lunch and dinner and lunch and tea and so on. Uh, occasionally, I will join you with my cup of coffee. So. Uh, I've chosen, uh, thank you, first of all, thank you very much to the organizers led by Professor Hari Krishnagar Nair. We have we met several years ago and we maintain a friendship, not only personally, but also through our work. I've also had the pleasure and honor of visiting his setup in uh, the university hospital in uh, Malaysia. Uh, so I've chosen the topic of venous leg ulcers, keeping it simple. Uh, why this uh, title? Uh, why this topic? The venous leg ulcer, as I hope to demonstrate to you, is the most common of chronic wounds. Uh, in the coming of, in the, while y'all were still joining, uh, our uh, session manager, our my host, uh, Dr. Poddar, said to me that uh, if you compare the human uh, animal, the human mammal, to an uh, internal combustion engine, the water car, the, as it slows down, as it gets 40 years plus, the car will get chronic problems. So in the same way, the human body also gets pro chronic problems. So healing must, a different type of healing must be expected. Of course, that is logic. But to that, I say to you that you know, there are, if you compare the human uh, animal, the human mammal to a... Uh, we're seeing so getting some feedback from the, uh, that I'm picking up some feedback. So uh, anyway, so we're going to talk about venous leg ulcers. It is the most common of chronic wounds. Uh, and I, I will draw on my, um, on the evidence that's in the literature, including our uh, uh, consensus guidelines, which we published a group of us some three or four years ago. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, Dr. Kozar, am I changing my slides or are you? Okay. Uh, while we are waiting for this uh, uh, to be sorted, yes, now we go to the next slide. Uh, Venus ulcers, I like the title Venus ulcers. It used to be called varicose ulcers, which is incorrect because it's because of a problem in the deep veins or superficial veins or both. And this is the reason to call it venous ulcers. In dermatology textbooks of the past, it was referred to as gravitational ulcers, stasis ulcers, because this is a condition seen in the elderly and caused by gravitation. So I think that's descriptive, but venous ulcers is scientific and precise. This slide shows a series of pictures um, on the screen. If you can see this, it's put together by modern PowerPoint techniques. Here's a, there's different types of venous ulcer, quite an extensive venous leg ulcer here. They're all the legs, they're all legs, lower extremity. It mostly appears around the ankles, one side, the medial malleolus on the, in the inner or outer, or in some cases, a circumferential ulcer. Venous ulcers may be easily mistaken for mixed arteriovenous ulcers. I will spend a minute or two about that for good reason, as you will see. The, the presentation is quite uh, classic. You can, they're small and sloping and almost oval in size. Now, uh, they're usually not very painful, but they can be. This is something important to remember. So there are several that came into our work, my practice, and the photograph there, each has its own uh, specific characteristics with underlying comorbidities. But to illustrate the point, here are two wounds, chronic wounds. One is an ischemic ulcer, small, punched out looking, and extremely painful. The result of peripheral vascular arterial disease, often upstream in the heart or the blood vessels of the body. And simple, the, 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 the pathogenesis is simple, blood flow and oxygen are denied to the tissues, tissue breakdown. So unless you repair that, you're not going to get tissue healing. Very painful. And some time ago when I started uh, working in this area when I was young and active and very busy, uh, it was difficult to manage this, manage active acute ischemic ulcers, except using gelinet and um, and good words and kind, uh, kind words. On the other hand, here's a venous ulcer, which is quite large on the right hand side, extreme right of your of the picture. Observe the extent of it, it goes from mid calf right through to mid foot, clearly infected. This was the problem in this patient's venous ulcer. The patient had underlying rheumatoid arthritis and osteomyelitis. So, uh, this, in this case, treatment was amputation. This is rare to amputate venous ulcers, but not impossible. Of course, lower extremity wounds include diabetic foot, um, mixed arteriovenous ulcers, pressure ulcers, some traumatic ulcers that don't, they don't uh, heal. They all get clubbed under the same header. But by, large, by and large, the venous ulcer is the most common some 80% of them appear so. So this is another terminology that has appeared in the literature and it's good to stick with it. Let's look, next slide, please. Okay, it is a major clinical challenge. Uh, I, I plan to step through uh, the background and epidemiology, pathogenesis, diagnosis and treatment and outlook with you. In the, in the time allocated to me. Uh, uh, the, the, we are able to give a very reliable diagnosis today. The concept of standardized care is well established. And uh, you know, I, in the last several years as I've traveled extensively in South Asia and Southeast Asia, I found centers endeavoring to set this up and I've had the honor of visiting Dr. Harry Nair's unit a few times, and that's a place to visit and learn more about it. Next slide, please. Okay. 
uh, a brief look at the epidemiology. Uh, the 3% of the population over 65 years of age have venous leg ulcers. This data comes from the work of, uh, uh, done by the vascular surgeon when you were seen, seen a registrar in, uh, in uh, Edinburgh. He subsequently moved to South of England to become a vascular consultant. And at that time, the best finding was that some one to 1.6%, 1 depending on which center did the study, was the, feel, uh, was the overall uh, prevalence. But if you looked at 65 and, and over, it was 3%. That's quite a number. The cost of management of venous ulcers is exorbitant. Recent studies in the UK show that some several billion, probably over 2 billion pounds spent on diagnosis and management of the problem. And every society, United States, Germany, um, France, and so on, Australia, all have similar data. It seems to be largely a problem in Western societies, Northern hemispheres, but not necessarily so. Uh, lower prevalence in younger populations has been, have been reported both in India by Professor Vijay Shukla from Varanasi and Zhao Bingfu in China. Both found similar, similar, reported similar findings that of lower extremity wounds, venous ulcer the most common, although recently Fu reported that diabetic foot has become more common, more prevalent in lower extremity wounds in the populations where he studied, which he studied in China. While on prevalence studies, I was bring, bring, a, uh, a, a, a bring to your notice that very recently, there has been a study from India uh, led by authors called Nag and Day, the dermatologist and the, and, and the diabetes consultant worked together. They showed that in a small cohort, 100 patients, they did a point prevalence and found 34% had venous ulcers. That's in a young cohort. This is talking between 40 and 60 which is quite, quite high compared to what we knew. Uh, then they also found that 11% of these had mixed arterial venous ulcers. Now, what are the takeaway messages from that study? Number one, that, you know, be careful with pop population studies that are done, um, that are reported. You've got to examine how they se selected their cohort and that selection is important to be able to place confidence on their findings. Secondly, uh, when I wrote to this authorship, they, they reported that their cohort were derived from the Cardiovascular Institute where all the patients with diabetes, endocrinologists were attending their endocrinology clinic. So naturally you are expecting a higher proportion of patients with blood flow, peripheral arterial disease, and they found it. But this could be a message to us all that 3% maybe or prevalence over 65 may be fine, but what we are seeing is that we're going to have, we may have more concomitant arterial and venous disease. This is something we have to bear in mind. More women have leg ulcers than men in the ratio 1.25 to one. Uh, I found this when I was uh, doing my PhD many, many years ago. Terence Ryan had reported that in his work it's even before that, in the early 50s, in Steve Anning, working from Leeds, had also observed that in his monograph on leg ulcers. Uh, the left leg is more prone to venous leg ulcers. You may ask why. And the belief is that since more women have leg ulcers than men, or venous ulcers than men, and men, and uh, the database seems to be fuller of uh, women with more than one pregnancy, and any one effect of multiple pregnancies is known to be on the venous side, venous incompetence, therefore venous hypertension, which causes venous leg ulcers. And, and uh, uh, more left lying fetal fetuses have been reported. So this is an observation and this is a suggested cause and effect. Uh, it doesn't make very much more uh, effect on management. It, what causes venous ulcers, uh, uh, what it precipitates the venous ulcer, Minor trauma, right through to which is with to uh, accidents, 
or minor trauma can be scratching, the skin is scratchy and we look at that and patient turn up and say, I scratched the skin, it tore and didn't heal to a young man who went on a skiing injury and reported to my friend dermatologist clinic and said in two months, this is not healed. There was some, you could see the fibrin deposition around it. So that took a while to heal. Uh, next slide, please. As I said, it's extremely uh, expensive and difficult to get reliable healing. But the experience of so many years is that you can get a good diagnosis and put them a good pathway to heal. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I trust you can see this clearly. On this slide, there are two diagrams, two sets of diagrams. If you go to the right-hand side, where I'm pulling the arrow around, uh, this is uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the diagnostic presentation. Uh, uh, the causes are deep venous insufficiency or deep venous incompetence, which results in insufficiency because the valve is rendered in, in valves in the leg are rendered incompetent due by DVT. This can also come from primary on the, on the superficial side where patients, some patients can have congenital aplasia. This is rare, but known. Um, I have come across at least two patients with that in my life's work. But nonetheless, the incompetence leads to higher pressures in the legs when you stand and this higher pressure does not get relieved with calf muscle pump activity, ambulatory venous hypertension. This leads to venous and capillary dilatation, decreased capillary perfusion pressures, so therefore less oxygen to the skin. Endothelial function can be affected, and so when you have a population with, with diabetes, and this is what we, we face on a daily basis everywhere, you must expect perfusion pressures to be affected for this reason too. And capillary permeability increases because of chronic dilatation in the, on, the, on the venous side. So uh, that will promote edema formation and that will cause swelling. Now, in these circumstances, some work done back in the 80s uh, by Vincent Falanga principally, who was then working in Miami, he took capillaries of ankle skin, you know, skin around the ankles where venous ulcers manifest, uh, and biopsied them and found pre-capillary fibrin to be deposited around the capillaries and suggested that this was acting as a barrier to nutritional transport. And therefore, this, was, this resulted in poor healing. Uh, several years later, but the same decade, uh, the guys from England led by Coleridge Smith said that white, white cells tra get trapped in the microcirculation and this cascade of events can cause uh, growth, impede capillary, uh, per, the, per, nutritional transport across capillaries. The effects of, uh, regardless of which cause is prevalent or acting together, the fact is that the skin, cha skin changes are observed the skin becomes dry the skin, because the, uh, the moisture is, is uh, released. Skin gets dry and cracked. There's uh, these, the uh, deposition of fibrin causes lipodermatous sclerosis. If you examine the leg, you can see that the leathery, leathery feeling to the skin, and that is ready to crack and make become an ulcerate. This was termed lipodermatous sclerosis in the 80s and is well defined. On the left-hand side of the screen, a cartoons which, which uh, to explain that this is a, the venous ulcer results from macro vascular problem, i.e. when there is venous incompetence causing increased venous pressure on the veins of the leg. Obviously, when we stand, it's maximal in the foot, but and since calf muscle pump function is, is, uh, is uh, upset, i.e. The pressure does not get reduced while walking. This persists. So we have a situation that persists. There's unrelieved uh, high venous pressure in the legs. And that is the cause of a venous leg ulcer. Next slide, please. OK, we'll look at the diagnosis and treatment. But you've done your clinical exam. 
and you can, the patient has told you the story and uh, what, what can we do to, to give you confidence that this is a venous ulcer. This is something that's been developed for the last 30, 40 years. And so now there's good evidence and it's been adopted into guidelines. So you would do well to take it on board. I dare say some of you may already be well familiar with the literature. The first step is to feel the pedal pulses if you're trained. There are some physicians, young physicians these days tell me that I'm not being trained to feel pedal pulses. Fair enough, in edematous legs, it's difficult to feel pedal pulses. And some 10% of males do not have a, uh, uh, have a pedal pulse, cannot be, the pedal pulse on one leg may not be palpable. So objectively, you can measure ankle to brachial index to exclude ischemia. Ankle to brachial index or ABI, uh, in the Europe, in Europe, in United Kingdom, we call it ABPI. Over there, I think you're more familiar with the American terminology of ABI. The measurement and the threshold should be between, if you get a pressure, ABI threshold between 0.9 and 1.2, you're dealing with a venous ulcer. This is well defined. And we'll look at that in a little more depth in a minute. The role of ultrasound using the duplex imaging technology permits measurements, and this is essential for surgical management of venous incompetence, including perforating measurements. This is vital, and this is happening, I believe, especially in Asia. We'll touch on the wound, be on wound bed and how you, what, what attention you should give it, what is pre preferred, debridement, which is an essential part of management, and compression, which is the mainstay of venous ulcer healing. This is all, this is all part of standard care. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a further look at the ABI. On the right-hand side is an angiogram of the foot. Uh, I've taken the slide with permission from Giacomo Clerici, a diabetologist from Modena in Italy. He published this in the International Journal. And you can see clearly the primary, the main arteries, the posterior tibial, anterior tibial, and the perineal arteries uh, clearly outlined in this picture, the many arteries of the leg and, of the, and foot are clear. So go back to what we are meant to be talking about. ABPI or ABI is an index of systolic pressure in, for example, in the posterior tibial artery or the dorsalis pedis artery uh, to the systolic pressure in the forearm. This has been well described. You know, patients ideally supine, and obviously rested for a few minutes after walking over to your clinic. You need a cuff and you need a Doppler probe. This, this uh, use a bit of jelly and apply it on the spot and you get the Doppler signal and use the cuff, which is about 10 centimeters proximal to where you're measuring um, ABI. And likewise, repeat it on the arm, ideally measured in bo on both sides and take the highest pressures. Now, remember that this is well described in all uh, guidelines. The Scottish SIGN guidelines are particularly good because it was, it was engineered and driven by nurses. So the description of this pressure is very good. What is equally important is that the thresholds of ABI have, have been validated. In the old days, they were validated one way and subsequently they've been validated by different techniques and in many, many centers. So we can cite them and use them usefully. And what are these guidelines? ABI between 0.9 and less than above 0.9 or equal to 0.9, less than 1.2, you can exclude arterial disease. Be confident, you're dealing with the venous leg also there. If ABI is less than or equal to 0.5, it's consistent with the presence of significant peripheral arterial disease. It, is the, it requires the presence or opinion of a vascular surgeon. Uh, we skipped slides, but the last, last one is, so, thank you. Uh, the third step is between 0.6 and 0.8, which is fixed arterial venous disease, where both the arterial and venous systems have been, flow has been affected. And I will touch on this again later on in my talk. Next slide now, please. These are duple pictures from duplex exam. I will, uh, at the bottom left-hand side, is a picture from the posterior view of the calf 
You can see the outlines of the tibial and fibular bones. This is, these are ultrasound pictures. And where you see the three dots of color, red, red orange colors, these are blood flow in the main arteries. On the right hand side, just slip across to the, your view to the right where you see uh, a CT done on the same leg while ultrasound was being formed. You can, was being performed. You can see dots or punctuated dots of the arteries and the bones, the two major bones, okay? So go above and you can see blood flow longitudinal across the screen. And in the, in the one further to the furthest to the right, you can see where it says B, that is the popliteal arch and that defines it. The colors of the duplex allow you to measure hemodynamic function. And so you can say, and that gives us a quantification this is work was published. It's widely known, every, uh, available everywhere, and hell of an important to measure duplex uh, to venous function. Next slide, please. Um, do, uh, we were on duplex ultrasonography, waveform analysis permits hemodynamic assessment, uh, that is how quality of flow, velocity of flow, and this benefits surgical management. To treat the arteries and veins, you need it, absolutely. And in the veins, duplex measurement of reflux, that is flow back from the veins of greater than 0.5 seconds is clinically significant. Remember that patients who've just been under, had anesthesia for operations recently or postpartum, these, you can get greater than 0.5. But this is just a data that you must remember. And the, but reflex measurement, especially important when you're planning surgical treatment. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, uh, have familiarized yourselves with the role of duplex in the management. Come to the wound bed. Now, local, I suggest, and we, we did this, included this in our uh, consensus guidelines document after a lot of examination of the evidence and came to the conclusion that local protocols for cleaning must be followed. They are the best and most applicable. It's common sense and it's applicable. And I include experience right from the Western West Coast to USA, right through to Shanghai and South Korea. This is what happened, including Malaysia and India. So local protocols. Debridement, again, as deemed necessary, a clinical decision is done, made to debride, and the, and the choice is dependent on the clinicians in charge. It is important and, and must be done the way uh, the clinicians decide. Uh, and then how do you treat? Mainstay of treatment for venous ulcers is compression. This is around the leg. Let's look at that. It's essential to heal and maintain in this state. Next slide, please. Uh, a brief look at infection. Do venous leg ulcers infect? Yes, of course they do. Um, if you take the bandage off and you allow the patient to walk around, it's like walking around with a Petri dish strapped to your leg. So most venous leg ulcers are colonized. One works, one exists in this, um, with this uh, belief, but to exclude the infection, you must use clinical signs and symptom scores. Now, uh, biopsies and so on are fine, but they're mostly uh, uh, for highly complicated cases and research studies. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've stepped through, we've got a good diagnosis. We've thought about wound infection and so on. Let's look at compression. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, this slide, this picture shows a four leg, four layer, ulcer, four layer venous uh, 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 compression bandage being laid on. Uh, it is the mainstay of treatment for venous leg ulcers. This statement is based on lots of evidence, starting with Compre with Cochrane studies, random of randomized controlled studies. The pressure is the bandaging starts just below the uh, base of the toes and wrapped around right up to the knee. Uh, the pressure is highest at the, at the ankle and reduces as it goes up towards the knee. Compression may be achieved using four layers or less. We used four layers a lot in the UK. Now we are moving towards three layers slowly. We use, uh, in Asia, I have seen two layers used. Uh, Dr. Nair, the, guy, the gentleman who put the course together, he uses two layers quite uh, co regularly and very confident about his data. And there's a good reason to do this and I applaud that success. Uh, what are the reasons behind this? Next, next slide, please. Let's look at the physics of this, which is 
which we published in a book by us, including Dr. Nair. This chapter was called Physics of Using Compression by myself and, uh, and um, uh, Patch, Professor Patch from, from, from Austria. Now let's look at the model on the right-hand side. The circle, the big circle is the leg, the small darker blue circle is the bones, okay? So the pressure that the bandage apply is the pulleys, it applies tension. The bandage applies tension on the skin, which many shows as skin as bandage pressure. The relationship between tension that the bandage applies and the skin pressure is governed by the size of the leg or the radius. The greater the radius, the less the pressure. For the same tension, the smaller the size of the leg, lesser the radius, the greater the tension. Very important. So this was defined by Laplace many, many years ago. The mathematical equations are well defined. Read the chapter or other books and you'll find them. Go to the left-hand side. Here's Hugo Patch's patient. See on the, the one, his patient has leg ulcers improved. It's got lots of standing venous disease. Wanted to treat it with bandaging, high compression bandages, but wanted to protect the uh, tendon that on the four, four aspect, aspect of the ankle. So decided you put some cotton wool. So increasing the size, the radius, so the, band, uh, the pressure of the bandage will be less, perceived less. So he protected the tension. And in this way, he, he was able to treat his patients with success. Next slide, please. Proof of concept. On the two uh, clinical pictures on the right-hand side, we see uh, where the arrow is. If you can see the arrow, you can see that this leg, the skin is dry, skin is pink around the ulcer. There is some healing, there's some slough, and the patient is venous, and the it's a ulcer is venous, and location is classical, and we need to treat it. So it is a Hugo Sparch patient who decided to have uh, high, four layer compression bandages, but decided to put some extra uh, extra bit of compression uh, with a pad over the over the wound. The uh, high pressure was applied, sustained, and on the few weeks later, you can see that the vein that the ulcer has healed. Pink epithelium surrounds where ulcer is to exist. The lipodermatous sclerosis is still there. That's going to stay for a while. It's a slow treatment, but then it requires skin care. Uh, with compression and, and skin care. But the point is the proof of concept is established. That's quite uh, dramatic. And that's why I wanted to share it with you. There's been lots of studies, uh, randomized control studies described in the, stu in the literature, other case reports and so on and so on, books written about it. So compression benefits venous leg ulcer healing. It is the mainstay, but healing rate is not affected by the number of bandage layers. If you are new to this field and you ask the question, how many bandage layers should I apply? Four, three, or two. Uh, remember that the number of bandage layers does not affect uh, healing. What affects it is the amount of pressure the bandage exerts and the sustain, sustainment of that pressure. Healing rates are variable from center to center. So try and not get put off or be one way or the other by the next center's healing rates because compliance is variable. Keith Harding from the UK, well known to Dr. Nair, has produced, uh, wrote a very good paper where he showed that the best compliance of, uh, for the use of compression is, is, is of derived when you use minimal number of layers, so, which is absurd. So there is the paradox. To treat best, you need more uh, layers, but they, your patients don't like it. And what we found is that multi-layer bandages do not work outside Northern Europe, Australia, and USA, because in environment, where the environmental temperatures and humidity are higher. For example, in India, where I go frequently in pre-lockdown days, or Malaysia, Shanghai, um, Chiang Mai, simply can't use it. So we need a new, uh, new thoughts, how to best apply compression. So there's work to be done in this, uh, in this uh, field, which and this is part of the clinical challenge. Next slide, please. Okay, vital to remember that venous incompetence will, will lead to edema formation. It is important to expel this edema. And so you can do that with compression bandaging or surgical management of venous incompetence. Surgical management of venous incompetence today, which, they, which is facilitated by the use of duplex imaging, 
they can reduce the pressure on standing by sealing these veins. Nowadays, they're doing it very well, and then it's all well described. And uh, I believe that in Asia, younger cohorts will get well treated with this, and they will have a, a long ulcer healing uh, life. Uh, locate the incompetence and manage uh, with uh, surgical techniques, uh, sealing, a radio frequency, etc., and then seal the veins and then bandage for a few days and then maintain with high pressure bandaging. But on the left hand side is a small slide from a commercial uh, product which is available in Asia, I'm sure, where which allows you to adjust the tension. Remember, I said that the tension you apply with bandaging is what determines the pressure on the skin. So this allows you to adjust the tension. So uh, we found that. Two days after a patient gets bandaging, within, within four hours, in fact, a lot of edema is, is, is lost. So the tension needs to be adjusted. And so herein lies the trick. That we, do we know this from evidence? Yes, the work of Giovanni Mosti has been instrumental in producing this, in giving the, the confidence of this. And there are new bandages, such as the left one shown on the left-hand side being available. And it's, it, it comes to me that Hugo Patch is, is very well known for his work in this field. Uh, a dermatologist from Austria. I believe your university is setting up a link to work with Austria. So I do hope all of you will come across Hugo Patch and benefit from his wisdom. Next slide, please. Uh, here is a device called Floyd 100, uh, which compresses using a slightly different technique, sequential contraction compression device. On the left-hand side, you can see the four electrodes on the leg. The pulse from the machine goes around and squeezes and compresses the calf muscles and blood flow is expelled. And use it carefully as a defined, you can get good ulcer healing. There are some clinical uh, studies shown on the right hand side. Venous ulcer of long standing duration, but when treated with this flow aid device, produced healing. Likewise, a heal ulcer also benefited from the use of this healing. The point is this that it offers a different type of healing. Patients benefit from being able to use it at home. And we have experience of a study done on patients with diabetic neuropathy and peripheral arterial disease in Vishwanathan's unit in Chennai, Madras, India, Chennai, India. And which shows that on those patients, it promoted blood flow and oxygenation to skin. A study is being completed in the famous uh, Harinar unit in Malaysia, and we look forward to seeing the data and all of you will benefit from learning about that. So this device and the other bandages and so on give, offer us a new paradigm and surgical management, a new paradigm for the treat for offering compression. Next slide, please. So um, we, we, we have got a good feeling on how to treat compression. What about pain? Remember, when the first text, the textbook of vascular surgery by Norman Browse, Professor Sir Norman Browse from St. Charing Cross, uh, sorry, from St. Thomas, he said, penis ulcer is not usually painful. And the nurse in the clinic, when she saw me with that textbook, just blew her mind off. I blew her mind and said, look, this is crazy. I think they've got pain. So it went through my head for years till Vijay Shukla sat down and defined it for our consensus guideline. First of all, determine its wound pain and then manage it. There is wound pain, but that, so the message is ulcers, venous ulcers are, can be painful. Determine its wound pain and then determine how you manage it best. Next slide, please. Now, a word of caution. I've shown you a slide titled venous leg ulcers. The left, one on the left is quite clearly an infected venous ulcer around the ankle area, very large and quite demonstrative. I used it for that purpose. On the right hand side, just look at that ulcer. Look at the leg before you can look at the wound. The leathery, dark brown, pigmented leg, a pigmented skin. If you look, and it is the ankle. If you look carefully, you can see the welt of edema, which results from the compression bandaging. But look at the shape of the ulcer. It's, it's circular as, a, as an ischemic ulcer looks. Now, the story is simple. The patient had a venous ulcer on the other leg for which he was being managed. And UK, in the UK, when it comes to summer, a lot of patients disappear from the clinic. They don't have a problem. Uh, that was the case when I was a young 
uh, medic. And they'd come back to the clinic after September saying, Dr. Malsa broke down. So he came back this time with an ulcer on the, on the other leg, which looked different. So we investigated and found it had a mixed, a mixed disease uh, with an ABPI of 0.6. Of course, you must not compress it. So we didn't know what to do till some guidelines began to suggest you, when you establish mixed pathology, mixed arterial venous pathology, you may give a degree of compression. Now, light compression is okay, but what, alert your patient to the fact that you're using some slight compression and he must be aware of that, that so that the best treatment is carried out where in, the, in the best circumstances. But recently, the work I referred to earlier by Nag and Day from India said that one third of the patients in that cohort had mixed disease. So treatment is different there. So you've got to be careful in your practice to remember to isolate if any arterial disease. They may be present, you can use a degree of compression. And there's a paper by Giovanni Mosti, which says com light compression is not contraindicated, not contraindicated in patients with venous ulcers. Because we are dealing with younger cohorts, especially in Asia, we're dealing with lots of diabetes being co-presence of diabetes. So that I believe is a watchword for you to go forward with. Next slide, please. Okay, again, sticking with the story of big pathology, what else did we know? Um, Alavi, who's a dermatologist based in, or works in Ontario, in, in Toronto. She did it from her clinic work, they came up with a finding of point prevalence of malignancy in wound cleaning. The importance is that some patients with non-healing venous ulcers, you, uh, which you can tell from the skin and the history, they, it's important to examine the wound edge and biopsy if, as necessary. Uh, Alavi, Afsana Alavi took, had several patients in this tertiary clinic. So they found a high prevalence in this small, small cohort. And she found that the older the cohort and the more uh, rare the, uh, the positioning of the ulcer, the presentation of the ulcer, the, high, the greater the chances of malignancy in the wound. So this slide is, gives you a guidance towards that. And this is something worthwhile knowing, because I know, in, for example, in China, all of China, there's a big study going on with a large number of, of chronic wounds. So they are, uh, well man they are well advised to go ahead and check this out. Next slide, please. So you've been hearing me go on for a little while. Um, so does this all work? It's a reasonable question to ask. Yes, of course it does. A good diagnosis is absolutely essential for standard care. The ways of diagnosing are well known. Compression, sustained compression is a must for treating these, device, these venous leg ulcer. New devices, we have some. Uh, we explored two, there may be others tomorrow. Surgery is, is essential. In, in, for certain patients. And there are good, if you, you work closely with a good surgeon, with a, and there are a number around uh, who will be prepared to treat the patients, you will get good healing. And in this young cohort, you may get accelerate, you may get prolonged healing for a while. This is something else we need to study. Accelerating healing. Now here is an open book. If you're working with standardized care, there are many ways of accelerating healing. And there's good evidence defined in the journals today, and you can keep your eyes open for that. And, and keeping it healed is in your hands. And that's the ultimate objective. Next please, slide, please. Okay, so what are my take home messages in case? Uh, yeah, and next slide, please. Chronic compression is essential to treat venous leg ulcers. When you're working with venous, when you're doing it, it Try to measure calf circumference, at least when you establish the confidence in your clinic. Where would you measure this confidence? At the point in the calf where the circumference is highest. It's termed B1 in the guidelines. And Hugo Patch, who I believe you all will work with, is uh, the one who has pushed this uh, work through based on his research. Measure calf circumference. If you want to measure 
pressure under bandages. There are two ways, two techniques, pressure bandage, pressure measurement techniques that are available, one in Europe and one in Australia, but you can access them in, in uh, Malaysia. And the second message, message, which I will enforce is that when you know it's arteriovenous disease pathology, mild compression is possible. And when you come across uh, the, in the literature, you'll say sustained compression, multi-layer compression, don't worry, two, three, four layers. It will not affect, it's the pressure you apply. It will not affect the, uh, the healing rate. If the pressure you apply and as the edema escapes from the leg, the tension must be, uh, must be maintained. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the consensus guideline. This goes back to several years ago, at least four, four or five years ago. And all of us in this slide uh, shown from, from the right-hand side is Marco Romanelli, who I believe has visited Malaysia, Akita, Theo, Failanga, Vijay Shukla, of course, and Dr. Nair works closely with him and, uh, and many others. Uh, we work together to derive this uh, consensus guidelines. It's well described in the literature and I recommend it to you for, for reading. Next, next slide, please. So these are some papers. There will be other papers. Uh, we also wrote a book and in which Dr. Nair made an invaluable, com uh, to which Dr. Nair made an invaluable com contribution with his, with his evidence, but also with his, with his knowledge of, and as an editor. Uh, it gives you a feeling to go on. There are a lot of journals these days that describe this. So it's up to you to read, and digest, distill, and synthesize, put the data together and use it to your uh, best uh, practice. So that's the end of our presentation. And I've sent you two questions for the question answers. And thank you very much for being so patient with me. Thank you, Prof. I just open the question and okay. we share just one minute. Uh, Dr. Pada, as you yes. are opening the question, because uh, while I'm on, 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 on screen, as it were, on air, as it were, if, if there are other questions from the audience, I'm happy to spend a few minutes as well, okay? Yes, yes. Uh, so we take question from the audience first? No, let's go to the, let's go to the question answers first, if okay. you don't mind. This guy is checking the link. <laughs> All right, okay. Link. Very slow moving and moving. Yeah. But remember, when I first came to England from India, it used to take nearly 30 hours or, or more. So in my lifetime, there have been many changes. Uh, maybe we should... Uh, uh, how are you doing with that? Uh, no, that's a uh, survey link I want to take. The link not opening yet. Besides, okay, I don't know how to take that. We not open this. It's not opening. No, I'm moving, sir. Okay. I don't know if uh, the audience can see. Well, indicate to the right of the screen. Of uh, no, the right uh, hand. I give the what to call that um, the, the survey link in the chat box, and the question in the. I will show the screen. Right, okay. One second.
sorry it is So, sir, have given some two questions. Yeah. Three questions for the yeah. participant. Yeah. So, I think you can see the slide now. Yeah, I can see the. If we go to the next one. Yes. Yeah. Show the show the question. Right. Okay. So, shall I read it? On the. Uh, uh, I'm giving the. Uh, Google link to reply in the chat box. Okay, okay. They don't have to answer. Yes, they can answer in the chat box. Uh, ah, right. So I'm. Should I look in the chat box? No, I am giving the link, and if they want, they can speak also. So you want as you want. Okay, don't. I am okay. So the first question is, what Just ankle breaker index? The, would... Okay, okay. So that one minute. Uh, yes. Oh yeah, okay. This is all about beyond me. I can't cope with this. <laughs> I, I would need to lie down. <laughs> no, sir. Okay. <laughs> I also the, just the, learned because for the COVID, we have to learn this. Yeah. <laughs> so, sir, uh, all participants, uh, you see the question, and sir, I prepared, and the Google form I have sent in the chat box. You check the multiple answer is there. You can reply in that form. Yeah. Just open yeah. and reply in the form. Then I open the answer. So, question can see. Everybody can see the question. No, I cannot see anything. Question not seen. No. Okay. View question. Okay. Okay, I again do. Can't see. Can't see. Okay. Can see now? Yeah, can see. Okay. Gone off. Okay. Why going off? Uh, okay. Uh, look, um, shall I just spend a few minutes in, in case there's any particular question they want to address while I'm here? They, they've yes, got the yes, question yes. answers, which they will reply on a Google link. Is that reasonable? So a yes, few sir. more minutes and then I'll sign off. So, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, Any question from anybody can ask sir? Yeah. Kindly unmute and ask anybody. Dr. Ken have put question in the chat box. Uh, can we use one layer of bandage but add on compression stocking instead of three to four layer of compression bandage? Well, the answer is yes, because it adds up as two layers. So the, the first layer, it's, it, you have to think about the first layer that goes next to the on skin. What the, so its properties, so you give some, it holds down the uh, wound dressing and, and its qualities, and then you use the second layer. But we used, we made the same, we made a mistake 40 years or so ago when I was starting. Uh, we used to use something called tubic, tubic gauze in UK. Tubic gauze has no compression for compressive properties. So we used to use it 
in the initial sense, they don't give any compression. So, but you know, if you use a, a layer and then compression, you're, you're, you're okay. You protect the skin and you're okay. But you've got to do the other bits, like treat the wound and so on. Okay. Another question from Dr. Rachel. Uh, besides compression, are there any particular secondary dressings that are used in treating venous ulcers? Right. Um, compression is not a dressing. Compression is the bandage that, that holds it down. Uh, but, uh, the, I don't want to confuse the participant by saying sometimes you can put pressure on the wound itself, extra pressure. That's underneath the bandage. But a wound dressing, there are literally thousands of wound dressings with some simple like gelinet, which is just a gauze with Vaseline and some very complicated, you know, bio, um, today's bio, biological dressings. There's a huge range of biological dressings, all widely described in literature. Both, they all coexist. Uh, each has a degree of, or brings something to the healing process. Um, the best guidance you can get today is that the wound dressing must be selected to, to match the stage of healing the wound is at. Okay, It may be hydrocolloid or it may be something more specific and so on. So sometimes you may have a in fact, a wound, wound call, you're not happy with the stage of colonization, infection, etc. You may want to use a silver dressing. So that is how you manipulate that. But you want that is the balance of using dressings. Okay. Dr. Ken again, at which point we should use vacuum dressing that create negative pressure? Oh. Well, vacuum, this is the okay. My first comment is that the Vacuum is not a dressing, but the way the, it has been treated by the regulatory authorities, it's become a dressing. Vacuum, vac technology is to clean the wound and prepare the wound bed for healing. Of course, it drains the extra uh, fluid in the leg and uh, the tissues and makes it ready for treatment. So uh, at what point should you use it? Once you debride, if, check that the, whether there's a need for debridement. And once you've answered that question, if you want to uh, treat, treat the tissues, uh, go ahead and use vacuum. Again, there's a, uh, the rule, use of vac and NPWT, different names, same technique, widely available, well described in many, many papers and randomized control studies and books. Okay, Dr. Ken. So next question from Dr. Khadija. Prof, how we want to know that the pressure that we apply via compression bandage are enough? Ah, I think what you mean is, is not more than the patient can bear. I think that is what the question is. Uh, uh, bandages, when you use the bandages, there's a guidance. You must pull, wrap around and pull to its maximum. Wrap around, pull to its maximum. The bandage itself has got diagrams to show that you have pulled it to its maximum tension. That is as far as using the bandage is concerned. Of course, you look at a patient's face when you apply the bandage. So you have to adjust it. And uh, especially in the days of four layer bandages when they were new, our nurses would keep the patient for at least half, 15 minutes after putting on the bandage. Say, check to make sure they're okay because once the bandages are on, you cannot feel the pedal pulses. Uh, so you don't know, you do, so you want to be careful about that. But objectively speaking, there are two or three, there are a couple of pressure sensors which can be inserted under bandages to measure the pressure. If you're working alone with no nurse support, so you can use it to guide, give guidance to your hand. Uh, they're available in Malaysia and because they're described in Australian as well as Western literature. Okay, next question from uh, Dr. Simon. Will tropical oxygen therapy along with compression bandage help to fasten the healing process or compression along by itself is more recommended? Well, 
there is no I mean, topical oxygen has been around for a number of years and uh, i worked with the inventor to to modify the pro, uh, the delivery of the of the topical oxygen now i know there's a dressing going around uh, first and foremost the answer is that a comparative study of the role of this dressing plus compression versus compression not has not yet been done there may be one in process uh, but i'm not at liberty to discuss to mention to talk more about that uh, we will see it in the literature but in certain cases uh, uh, topical oxygen the oxygen has been described in from case reports to be beneficial uh, we need more evidence to understand and how to select the patient we believe that under the dressing there is extra oxygen partial pressure of oxygen increases but how to select the patients is something we are waiting for and i i, I the studies that are now current um uh, i think uh professor harry is one of the guys who's working on that and we may be able from his study he'll be able to tell us more okay sir so another two question do you professor hamui asked that do you recommend island grafting is to shorten the healing time in addition to the bandage well uh you know you would have to select the patient and the plastic surgeon as well i suspect the questioner is a maybe is the questioner a surgeon yes prof uh, is here okay you can ask prof unmute yourself okay are you a surgeon sir yes sir I'm, yes 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 i am okay. a surgeon uh, general and vascular surgeon also and i i used to do that just for large venous ulcers that takes long time to heal so i would like to hear your view about it first and foremost is that the evidence based gui guideline of comparing the role of island uh, grafts versus compression therapy don't exist but uh, let me give you a little bit of of evidence from the old days and that by that i mean 19 early, early 1980s those days grafts pinch grafts were done by dermatologists and nowadays it's almost exclusively island grafts that are done by plastic surgeons i pinch grafts used to fail and the reason it failed was that these patients had perforating veins uh for your audience perforating veins connect skin with deep vessel is meant to go one way blood goes from the skin into the deep vein but when when conditions are disrupted blood will flow back to the skin so unless you treat the perforating vein any surgery of the deep vein any valve any graft repair is does not stand the best chance of success this is what happened with the royal free study and dermatologists have virtually stopped doing pinch grafting over in western countries but come the question is about island dressing which surgeons should apply by all means and especially with big ulcers i think there is a role for it but uh, my uh, my expectation is that you would care have a request your angiologist to give you good guidance as far as the status of the deep veins and the perforating veins is concerned and if you have a leg where the pressure is Uh, retrograde pressure is maintained following surgery great you know you may get uh, long lasting healing that would be a paper i'd like to read in future thank you okay prof and and the question is there prof may you share how to make patient complain to compression bandage as in malaysia the weather is hot and also she asked that if suitable for venous ulcer leg wound we do split screen graft if yes how the outcome means okay. uh, when the suitable time we want to do the split screen graft well uh, we are now talking about how to keep an ulcer healed uh, heal it and how to keep it healed there are two different questions both equally difficult um, compliance is like with any treatment compliance to compression bandage is like with any treatment you know uh, in the last uh, week I, i started reading a book from my youth 
The book is described, is written by Archie Cochrane, a, a physician who set up, uh, the, who de described the use of a statistical technique known as randomized controlled studies. Today, we all use it. I've used it myself many times. Why am I talking about this? Because Archie Cochrane described, his book is called Efficiency and Effectiveness in the National Service. Okay. So in that he describes, he talks about compliance. This is a major thing, and how to and um, the human animal is is the only one major difference between the human and the uh, mammal and the, and animals is that a human will take medicine when they want to get better. So by definition, when patients are not compliant, they're not wanting to get better. But chronic diseases, this is always an issue. But we know that uh, when you go, go down to four layers and three layers, you talk about that, it's really not applicable in hot, warm, humid climates, not only in Asia and Africa, but also in some parts of Southern France and the Mediterranean. So the options, today you have options. First of all, the evidence is use two layers if necessary, and try, try your patients two layers and demonstrate that it works better, encourage them those who can be mobile, encourage them to be mobile. And one trick, when I first met Harry Nair several years ago, um, I asked him, uh, how does he manage to get his patients to, uh, you know, cope with less layers and uh, manage? He said, that's easy. I get them to come back to the clinic. I order them to come back to the clinic. So obviously he succeeds with that. So that the, the attention they get from the doctor he may not be there every week because clearly he is in many countries at all times, except during lockdown. So you can't see the patient regularly, but his advice is come back to the clinic. We will look at your wound. We will help you the, with that. So he, that helps compliance, but especially in the mobile uh, patient cohort, those who are mobile and, and you in Asia will see more mobile patients. So they are doing this. And this is one way of, of making them compliant. The other ways are, look to the other uh, techniques. For example, the technique of changing tension. The aim is to reduce the tension with bandages. I think that Sri Gvadish or somebody manufactures this and well, I'm sure it's available over in, the, in your country, but the other device also available in your country and look to using it to see how to apply compression. So it's a, um, it's a, uh, you have to win your patient over and keep them going. Another technique, this is, is to trace the wound. Uh, nowadays, you can use mobile phones to take pictures, you can calculate areas, especially if you're doing research study. But you do this religiously. And I use that word in a, in a non-religious sense. You have the areas and you can show your patient. So it's reducing because if you take a, a curved surface and flatten this, the area becomes different. So you can show them on flat surfaces, your wound is actually getting better using compression. So encourage them. The key and another step in that regard is if you decide to, you know, this patient requires more attention, then you measure the calf circumference where with a tape, you don't have to, go, to use complicated techniques, just use a tape measure, Taylor's tape around the biggest calf size, make them stand or sit with the legs dangling, measure it. And when you see a difference, write it down and show the patient. They, they, they will be encouraged to carry on using compression. Thank you, Prof. And okay. there is another last question, I think. I uh, request everybody to fill the form. Only 6% filled the answer. Okay. Okay. So Mr. Maniam has asked how to prevent complications from venous insufficiency. Your advice, please how to prevent complications from venous insufficiency? Well, I'm not sure what, uh, if you're looking at vascular complications he's thinking of, but uh, uh, once the skin, if, before the skin, okay, you have a patient with venous disease and no, no ulcers, and uh, um, that's managing the, uh, and varicose veins, that's management of varicose veins. That becomes a different ball game. Uh, in, in, in the Western hemisphere where I live and uh, so on, vascular, uh, varicose veins are managed by, plastics, uh, by vascular surgeons. 
This is not to say other surgeons may not manage them. So the guidelines are well described for management. And today they can seal off the high pressure, the veins which are incompetent, causing leaks of blood flow down to the leg. You seal those veins and the pressure goes down. So a complication which is dry skin and needs some form of emollient or even some something more strong like a hydrocortisone may be necessary to, to get this quality of skin better. And that's, that's a complication. Uh, and so that, manage that and try and do without an ulcer. But once you got it and a leg ulcer, it becomes important that, that you've got compression to manage it. So in the, things like injections to treat blowouts and things are quite rare, but done uh, occasionally. Okay. Okay, sir, sir, I shared the reply so that we can understand the response. So we can see that here we received, this is the answer we have received. Uh, okay. Uh, Would you like to sir? read it out because I can't uh, read okay, it. Okay, let me enlarge it a bit. Oh, okay, okay, that's better. So what ABI would you expect in a patient with a vasculitic lesion? I mean, I, I was, this is a trick question, obviously. I didn't describe a vasculitic ulcer, although the audience may be well familiar with it. ABI of blue is 0.5, between 0.4 and, yeah, can't measure. Uh, which, so 83% said between, 83.3 said between 0.5. Okay, that's reasonable, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is, what is the diagnosis of the wound shown in the image gotcha. on the R? So 83% yeah. give vasculitic lesions yeah. and 16% ischemic ulcer. Right. So the majority got it right. It, is a, it's, it shows pyoderma gangrenous, which is common in Asia and Africa and so on. Uh, it's a rare event in Western countries. But you can get it without any vascular disorders, although it, the biodermal gangrenism itself is caused by microvascular disorders, but you can get both coexisting. In that case, it is coexisting venous and... Uh, so, but the uh, last one is how do you accelerate the healing? So the greatest everybody, told, everybody told deliver completion to suit the needs. Very good. Well done. You're working with a good leader, Dr. Harry is a good, uh, uh, great uh, wound healer. So and he's doing well. Okay. Okay, so any more question for anybody? Otherwise I request everybody to on camera, we take a group photo with sir. Prof, I have one question that if it is leprosy type of disease, then we can apply the same wound care techniques as we using for diabetes. Uh, the compression the techniques. Um, there was some work done in Paranasi, where uh, uh, Pande, Dr. Pande, was the dermatologist at the time. He was in charge of that work. Uh, the vascular problem you could you would treat in the same way compression, but you have to take care of yes. So you have to take care of the pressure you apply because neuropathy uh, they, they, uh, is a feature of, of uh, Hansen's disease as well. Okay, sir. Okay, everybody on camera, please. May, Madam Supama, your camera is upside down. <laughs> Maybe she's in space. Uh, something, some disorder. Oh, opposite, sir. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. Uh, am I on? Yeah. Okay. Am I on? Yes, I think I am. Yes, Dr. Pa. No opposite. Not opposite. <laughs> okay, I think everybody on almost. Ready? One, two, three. Next uh, page, going to. Okay, done.
Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all very really much. I wish you very well. And I look forward to uh, interacting with you guys at some stage or other. And to, my, to Professor Harry, Harry, we'll catch up sometime. Yep. Take care, Raj. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Everybody have a good day. Thank you. Take care. I want to listen from everybody. Any uh, comment on you? If Prof left also, no problem. If I have Prof busy, you can leave. But you can share your experience that what you learned and what you're thinking, what you want to do after mm -hmm. this workshop, move forward. Your opinion. Uh, you're asking me, sorry. No, <laughs> yes, yes, everybody, prof, all participant. I can ask by one by one. I think it's a, it's a good workshop. Uh, it overviewed uh, a very common problem here in Malaysia. And I'm sure the attendance, uh, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't say learned a lot, but at least uh, they refreshed their knowledge about the wound management. So I, I, I would presume it's very helpful. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandy. Thank you, Prof. Hamoui. <coughs> okay, now Dr. Khadija. Uh, Dr. Sandy, I just want to ask, uh, uh, actually, when the, exactly the course uh, that will be held for diploma in wounds in Lincoln University College? So, yes, uh, we applied, so we will uh, get soon. As soon as get, I will inform all of you. Within this year, we should start we able to, but we are not uh, sure at how uh, fast we can get approval because the lockdown, etc. going on. But we hope, said uh, Madam, that we can start by this year. Okay. We'll inform. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ms. Uh, Madam Shupama? Yeah, I was just about to say, since uh, this is a uh, workshop concerns uh, team work, team nursing, I was wondering if uh, some something on some nurses work or some, you know, paper on nursing would have been very interesting. Would have been able to share with us. Thank okay. you. See, the next webinar, what you call this, we'll be getting some of the uh, nursing professors coming in, like Professor Karen Ose from UK and all that. So we will have uh, what you call this, a different range of them. Oh, okay. That'll be good. Thank you. We are working on that, madam. Uh, Dr. Hari, <laughs> we will do that, madam. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chan. Dr. Chan Biu, Dr. Cheryl, Dr. Nathan, yes, Dr. Cheryl. Yeah, yes, um, sir. I think I do learn a lot, and it's quite interesting topic uh, for the past two days. And um, I think um, so far everything is good. Yeah, <laughs> I have no complaint really. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Nathan? Yes, sir. I think these two days has been a great contribution towards our knowledge in wound care. And uh, I feel that uh, I've learned much. Thank you to Lincoln and uh, Prof. Hari and you as well as a moderator. And looking forward for the program with Lincoln so that uh, we can share the vision of Prof. Hari in establishing a better wound care management in Malaysia. Back to you, sir. Thank you. And Dr. Shiva? Dr. Maniam. I'm you unmute, sir. I'm a student of Prof. Wali, eh? Prof. Wali from University Lincoln, Kota Baru. Eh? Uh, to me, it's a really valuable knowledge. La. It's additional knowledge after many years going back to medical school like that. So it was very beneficial and uh, all many things are quite new to me, like especially the modern medicine. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Kian. Hello. Hi. Yes. Uh, I would like to take the chance to thank everyone for organizing this, especially Prof. Harry and you. Uh, we learned a lot. And uh, sorry if we ask too many questions. 
no two less question because only now this session only you ask question other session no question uh because prof harry uh prof raj give us a lot of inspiration in during the lecture presentation and we have a lot of talk from it yes his presence is all itself is inspiration <laughs> thank you prof thank you uh, and dr may Dr. Lee, Dr. Niti, Dr. Nijam, Dr. Pal, Madam, Madam Sabrina. Yes, unmute, madam. Okay, actually, I am uh, I'm nursing student, but I really, really appreciate and would like to thank you because uh, give me a chance to uh, join this workshop because I really proud to myself because I can learn a lot more about the wound care. Thank you so much. Okay, and Dr. Shu, Shu Jing. I think everybody, okay. 